Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this service. And how wonderful it is for you and I to join together in this particular way this Sunday morning. We come together, of course, in the name of Jesus Christ, who loves us and who died on the cross for us, but by God's mighty power rose to life once again. And don't forget that amazing promise of the Lord Jesus that where two or three people gather in his name, then he will be right there amongst them. And wherever we are, we are joined together in the name of Jesus. You in your home, I here in the church building of St. Columbus Church, we are together in the name of Jesus. And I hope, therefore, that you will believe what I believe, which is that the Lord Jesus Christ is here amongst us. Well, let's worship him together. Let's worship the living God. We're going to sing that wonderful song of praise. You're the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who was slain. If you're watching this service on Facebook, you'll see the lyrics for all of our songs and our Bible readings come up in the comments thread. You're the Lion of Judah, the Lamb that was slain. You ascended to heaven and evermore will reign. At the end of the age when the earth you reclaim, you will gather the nations before you. And the eyes of all men will be fixed on the Lamb who was crucified. For with wisdom and mercy and justice you reign at the bar. The side, and the angels will cry, Hail the Lamb who was slain for the world, ruling power, and the earth will reply. And a sword at our side There's a fire in our spirit That cannot be denied As the Father has told us For these you have died For the nations that gather before you And the ears of all men Need to hear of the Lamb Who was crucified Who descended to hell Yet was raised up to reign At the Father's side And the Well, that's a terrific hymn, isn't it? It reminds us that Jesus Christ is the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And in the face of even such a thing as a global pandemic, it's terrific to remind ourselves that we don't stand alone, nor are we standing with someone alongside us who is only limited in power. Jesus Christ rose from the grave, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Well, we're going to pray together now, and I invite you to say some of the words of Psalm number 51 with me as a way of confessing our sins, but inviting the Holy Spirit to refresh a love and a joy towards uh, God in our hearts. So join me as we say together, do not banish me from your presence. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, 
that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. Well, let's all now pray together. Father in heaven, we meet together here in this church, but also connected digitally, many in their own homes, to worship you, to offer you praise, to seek forgiveness for our sins, to ask for the help of your Holy Spirit, to read your written word and to listen for your voice. Father, you call us to come to you just as we are so that you can help us and make us the people, the disciples of Jesus that we ought to be and want to be. <clears throat> Please forgive us for the wrong that we have done in our actions, through our neglects, our thoughts and our words. We know, Heavenly Father, that we have hurt other people, including those whom we love the most. We have let the Lord Jesus down, and we have also let ourselves down. We readily confess all of these things, knowing that you are more willing to forgive us than we can ever imagine. And so we trust that you are pardoning us right at this very moment. Thank you, loving Father. It's been a hard week for many of us, and many are feeling low. Loving God, this virus and all of the consequences that it brings are beginning to get us down. Help us to keep our eyes fixed firmly on you. And when we begin to feel that there is so much that we are dearly missing, remind us, please, that as your children, we have in you everything that we could ever want or need. Speak to us through the Bible and teach us your ways so that we may love the Lord Jesus and represent him well in this fallen world. In the name of Jesus, we pray all of these things. <clears throat> and now will you join me, dear friends, in saying the words of the Lord's Prayer, that model and pattern of prayer that Jesus Christ has given to us. And please feel free to say any version of the Lord's Prayer that you are most familiar with. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us give in to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power and glory are yours forever. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Well, let's now turn to God's written word, the Bible. And I want to read a section to you from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, the first nine verses. And here the disciples of Jesus are discussing with him who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now about that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting. So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life 
with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Well, dear friends, let me say something to you about that portion from God's written word, Matthew's gospel. <clears throat> and my message this morning is the continuation of our series of Sunday messages, which are called Be My Disciples. Be My Disciples. We're thinking about what it really means in this world to be a faithful, fruitful, effective, loving, obedient disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> there is sometimes a temptation that faces Christian people in congregations. And by the way, even as I say that, it occurs to me that this is a temptation for ministers as well. And perhaps it's a particular temptation for ministers and pastors in the church. And it's the temptation to be seen as an important person in the life of the church or the congregation. And when we're thinking about Christian discipleship, we're thinking about really what the heart looks like what God sees when he looks at our inner nature. Being a Christian disciple, of course, in this world does mean that we have to live in a certain way and behave in a particular manner. There's no doubt about that. But those outward manifestations of Christian faithfulness are completely irrelevant to God unless they come out of a heart that is repentant and humble and entirely dependent upon him as Savior and Father. The disciples of Jesus took quite a while to understand that fully. They came to Jesus knowing that he was starting and building a new kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. They wanted to know who would have the positions, the really important positions, in his hierarchy. And like some Christians and some ministers in the church today, they wanted to know which of them would be most important in the life of his kingdom and so Matthew tells us in his gospel the question that they asked Jesus, and it was this, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, as soon as you start to think about your position in the hierarchy of a congregation or in the hierarchy of a denomination, in the hierarchy of the church of Jesus Christ, and about the importance of your role in the life of the church or how near you are to those who have or who seem to have importance and prestige and power and position within the life of the church, you're thinking in precisely the way in which these disciples were thinking when they asked Jesus the question. And they were thinking in a worldly way. They were thinking on the basis and premise of personal ambition. So it's really important that we understand what the kingdom of heaven is about. The kingdom of heaven is made up of all of those who have received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and have repented of all of their sins, including selfishness and self-centeredness. One of the realities of the church as we see it here on earth is that it's always a mixed company of men and women. The church is always made up of those who are saved and who have submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, but mixed in with it, are others who look the same and who speak the same and in some cases even dress the same, but for all intents and purposes are not Christian men and women in terms of their heart and its orientation towards God. And Jesus makes it quite clear that the kingdom of heaven is made up of all of those who are in a right relationship to God through repentance and new life. And the way that he proved this was to take a small child <clears throat> and to put that small child in the middle of all of the disciples. And then he turned to the disciples and he said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins, that's really important in the Christian life, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is making it absolutely crystal clear that you do not belong to the kingdom of heaven unless you have turned from your sins and in humility received Jesus Christ into your life as Savior and Lord. It's a matter of recognizing that we've been wrong all along about God, wrong all along about ourselves, and that without repenting of all of those wrong thoughts and the wrongful actions and lifestyle that emanates from that, we can never belong to the kingdom of God and we will be lost forevermore. <clears throat> the greatest ones 
the greatest ones in the kingdom of heaven, are always those who remain as humble and as unassuming as they continue through the Christian life as they were at the start when they received Jesus. I want to say something to you about my own experience. In my own experience of the Christian church, I have seen Christians in very senior positions in the church, the widest possible expression of the church, holding on to a very high view of themselves and with a great sense of their own importance. And right on the other hand, in my experience of the Christian church, I have seen some of the most moving and profound godliness and holiness and Christian love amongst men and women who serve in the most menial and unremarkable ways in the life of a congregation. And I don't need to have a discussion with you about who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven because you also have seen Christian leaders like that and you have also seen humble servants of the church like that and you and I know who are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You and I both know that Jesus Christ is telling the truth here. So we want to be the sort of disciples that Jesus calls us to be, the sort of disciples who give him the greatest pleasure and also the least trouble. Think about that. Discipleship means giving Jesus the least trouble. And Jesus is telling us as disciples to adopt the humility of a child because the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like that. That is the state of heart which Jesus approves of. So that's the first thing that we really need to grasp on this portion of Matthew's gospel. It's about the way that we are in our hearts. God calls us to be humble. But I want to say something further than that. It's one thing to be humble, but discipleship, faithful, authentic, obedient discipleship, is also about our manner towards other people. If humbleness or humility, if you like, is an inner quality and characteristic created by the Holy Spirit, then our manner towards other people is an expression of that. Because here's the thing, sometimes Christian people can show very little Christ-likeness in their dealings with others. Sometimes there's very little of Jesus that's discernible in the way that we speak, the things that we say and the manner in which we behave towards other people. And we need to be very careful about this about the things that we do, the things that we say, the way we present ourselves before the eyes of the world, particularly before the eyes of those who do not yet follow Jesus Christ. Because those things, that faulty, that sinful, that unchristlike manner that we might present before other people can put them entirely off Jesus Christ and call them to fall, fall into sin. And Jesus had a somber warning for his disciples about that. He said, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. And so, dear friends, there is a great responsibility that is given to you and to me as disciples of Christ. It is that we live in such a way that people are warmly attracted to Jesus Christ and not repelled away from him. And when Jesus talks about welcoming little children on his behalf, he really means much more than that. He means that we should live in such a way that ordinary men and women, the little people of life, if you like, feel drawn in and welcomed by Jesus Christ. But there is that somber warning, of course, and sometimes Christian people don't like the way in which the Bible tells us that Jesus gives warnings or that God feels anger and expresses it. But here is a clear warning from Jesus. By our behavior and by our manner, we can put people off turning to Jesus Christ for salvation. Or we might even, by our manner, cause other believers to be despondent to the point where they no longer want to follow Jesus Christ or belong to the church. And Jesus says that he will not be indifferent to that. It would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. So the condition of our heart and the state of our inner nature is fundamental to being a good and faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, let me just say something about this thing about having 
a, a manner, a lifestyle that is either attractive, inviting people to consider Jesus Christ, or is repellent, causing them not to want to even think about him at all. I once <coughs> knew of a married minister who had an affair many, many years ago, and it became public knowledge. There was inevitably a great amount of hurt. The wider church was involved. There was the application of church discipline. After a length of time and due process, the minister was able to continue his ministry. But I remember this. Some years later, I met a man who was an adherent of another religion, another world faith. And although I don't remember after the passing of so many years what the man said precisely, I cannot forget the way in which he expected more of a Christian minister and in the way in which he would forever regard that minister and his lifestyle as hypocritical. Now ask yourself this. Ask yourself if that man who belonged to another world religion would be more or less likely to consider repenting of his sins and following Christ, having become aware of that Christian minister's behavior. And if things had been different, if he had not seen an example of hypocrisy blatantly, would he have been more interested in thinking about Jesus Christ? There's a very real possibility that he would. And that's precisely what Jesus is getting at when he tells us that we have to watch that we don't cause little ones to fall into sin. And let me make just one more point, one final point, as we think about this section from Matthew's Gospel. And it's really about what we should do when we find ourselves overwhelmed with a strong or powerful temptation. You and I, of course, we are human beings. We are tempted from time to time and Perhaps some of our temptations are similar. Other temptations that you and I face are different, of course. Some of our temptations are easy to resist, but others are really quite powerful, and if we're not careful, they will overwhelm us, and we will cave into them. And when we do, there will be great hurt to ourselves and to others. So if there's something in your life as a disciple of Christ, Jesus says, don't tolerate it. Don't put up with it. Don't live comfortably with it. Get rid of it, and radically if you need to. He says, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. And the reason that Jesus says, take such radical action in the face of temptation is because temptation and sin are powerful forces. I remember once having a discussion with a man who found that to be a terribly difficult thing to understand because he was thinking that Jesus was saying quite literally that a Christian man or woman should amputate a limb if that was the cause of his or her sinning. Actually, Jesus is not speaking Literally, he's speaking figuratively, but he still is speaking forcefully. He's speaking here like a typical first century Jewish rabbi. He's using hyperbole, which, as we all know, means exaggeration for effect. Jesus is exaggerating in order to help us to see that we need to take radical action when we're faced by temptation and sin. And so if there is something in our lives that is causing us to disobey God or to do what the Holy Spirit tells us not to do, we should surgically remove it and cut it out of our life. We should excise it. We should excise it. Not amputate a limb, of course. But we should deal radically with our thoughts and with our habits. If our spending power is leading us astray, we need to deal with that. If the friendships that we keep lead us from away from following the path of Jesus Christ and lead us into doing things that God does not want us to do, whatever it is, we need to remove it from our lives. Why? Why? Because it's better, far better, to cut things out of your life. Things that perhaps other people are enjoying and even experiencing, it's far better to cut those out of your life if they're a hindrance to your obedience towards God and a possible cause for you to miss out on eternal life and instead to spend eternity in a miserable separation from the living, loving God. If your eye 
the things that you look at, the things that you read, the things that you glance towards, if your eye causes you to think or to speak or to act in a way that is contrary to God's word and his commands and his laws, then, says Jesus, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fires of hell. Let me bring, dear friends, these thoughts to a conclusion. The greatest privilege in life for you and for me in this world is to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, in his great mercy, causes us to come to Jesus and to be lifelong learners in his kingdom. If we get our hearts right with the help of the Holy Spirit, if our hearts are humble, then our outward behavior will follow. Where the heart leads, the body always follows. We need to be in the first instance humble enough to learn from our wrongful ways and to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Secondly, we need to ensure that our manner and the way in which we behave doesn't drive people away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Lastly, if we're to be faithful disciples of Jesus, we need to have a robust and determined attitude towards sin and temptation. Temptations are inevitable, says Jesus, but when they do come, we need to cut them out of our lives in case they turn into full-blown sin and drag us down into an eternity of separation from God. Well, may the Holy Spirit fill us with humility and with winsomeness and with radical holiness so that our lives count for the kingdom, however short or long they are, bringing glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, to live in that way, we need the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's sing a song now, which really is a prayer. Let's sing, Strength Will Rise As We Wait Upon the Lord. Oh, God. 
that's a wonderful promise from God that if we wait on Him, if we seek Him, and if we spend time in His presence, He will strengthen us up and renew us so that we rise up on wings like eagles. Well, for the last number of Sunday mornings, I've been speaking to children and young people who have been connecting with us and been part of our service. And I've been telling stories about Christian heroes of faith. And I want this morning to tell a little bit about the story of a great hero of the Christian church, a man by the name of Martin Luther. Martin Luther lived, well, he was born in the 1400s, so a very, very long time ago, but he really has been very, very important for Christians. Martin Luther was born in Germany, and his father was a very, very rich man. He wanted Martin, when he grew up, also to become a very important man, maybe even a lawyer. Well, Martin went after school, he went to university, but he was very, very bored with that. He started to think about God. One day, he was riding a horse, and there was a terrific storm all around about him. A great flash of lightning, a lightning bolt crashed to the ground, near him, and he was terrified, and Martin Luther prayed. He decided that he would become a monk. A monk is a person who perhaps lives mostly in a big house with other monks. They don't marry. They spend their life praying and working, trying to help other people in the name of Jesus. Martin Luther wanted to be friends with Jesus, but even though he was a monk, he didn't know how. How do you become a friend of Jesus, he wondered. He thought that perhaps if he prayed for hours and hours and hours every day, God would love him if he did that. Martin didn't realize that God loved Martin anyway, and that if Martin simply trusted Jesus, he could easily become Jesus' friend. Eventually, Martin realized that we do become God's friends, the friends of Jesus, not because we pray for hours and hours and hours and try really hard, but we become the friends of Jesus simply by saying sorry for the wrong things we've done and trusting Jesus. Martin, was he felt in his heart that this was so important that he wrote down 95, yes, 95 thoughts on a great big piece of paper and he took them to the door of the church, the big heavy wooden door of the church, and he hammered the 95 thoughts into the door of the church. People in the church were furious about that. In fact, People all around about the country were furious about that. Who do you think you are, Martin Luther, many people said. But Martin Luther did not back down. He said that God was more important than church leaders. This made lots of people in the church think some really, really nasty thoughts about Martin Luther. But it made lots of other people think some right thoughts about God. Martin Luther had to go on the run to stay safe. But he discovered something very, very important that needed to be rediscovered by Christians everywhere. And it's this, that God's friendship is a gift to us. We can't earn it. We can't do lots of good things to make God our friend. God becomes our friend and our father when we say sorry for the wrong things we've done and begin to follow his son, Jesus. Well, Martin Luther became a follower of Jesus and God's child. And so I want to ask, do you want to be a child of God? Do you want God to be your father? And do you want to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? If you do, then just say sorry to God for the wrong things you've done and ask Jesus to come into your heart and to make you his friend and follower for the rest of your life. And when other people say that you are wrong, like they said that Martin Luther was wrong, You just keep trusting in Jesus and in all that Jesus says in the Bible. Well, let's sing a song together. I'm sure that you know this particular song. It's a very easy one. It's a song that reminds us that God is strong and powerful and he always wants to help us. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. The mountains are his, the valleys are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing that he cannot do. Let's sing that together. 
together again. all pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the many wonderful blessings that you shower upon us every single day of life. But more than anything else, we thank you for the mercy that you've shown us through Jesus. We know that we do not deserve your love or your friendship but through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Son, you have graciously reconciled us to yourself and filled us with your Holy Spirit. We take this moment, loving God, to recommit ourselves to the Lord Jesus and to communicating his good news of eternal life to other people, to young people and older people. We ask you to help us to show them the love of Jesus Christ so that all that we do and say may help other people to know him and follow him as well. We pray your blessing, loving God, on those who need your help in their lives today. We pray for those who remain frightened about the coronavirus. We pray for those who have become infected, for those who have been hospitalized, and for those who have been bereaved as a consequence of this virus. We pray also for those who are struggling with other health conditions and for those in hospital. We pray for those who are living with a great pain of loss and for those whose hearts are broken. We also pray, Heavenly Father, for those struggling on a day-to-day -day basis to find adequate food, to pay the bills and to look after their loved ones. We pray, loving God, for those who care for others for those in the National Health Service, for those who support and encourage, for those who lead and give advice. Heavenly Father, you are the source of all goodness and all blessing. Pour out your blessing on all of those whom we have mentioned. And would you please give the gift of eternal life to those whom we love, our family members and friends those who have not received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We pray these things in the name that is above all other names, the name of Jesus, our King and our friend. Amen. <coughs> Well, dear friends, it's been wonderful to worship together in this way this morning. We're going to sing one final hymn together as we bring our time of worship to a conclusion. We're going to sing those wonderful words, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. And of course, it has that wonderful chorus, doesn't it, where we all sing together, our God reigns, our God reigns. And that's a, a declaration, of course, of our faith and our trust that above all of the circumstances of this world, God is reigning and ruling, and there is no need for us to be frightened. Join me as we sing this together. How lovely he on the mountains are the feet of him. Watchman live. 
eye to eye. The Lord restoring Zion, your God reigns. Your God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Waste places are Jerusalem break door to door. We are. has saved and comforted his people. Your God reigns. Your God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. of the earth see the salvation of your God Jesus is Lord is Lord before the nations he has been his holy arm your God reigns your God reigns With your friends, as we bring our service to a close, allow that thought to be the thought that goes with you into the week ahead, that our God reigns over all of the circumstances that we face together. God willing, we'll join together next Sunday at uh, the same time, 10.30 uh, London time, and we will worship uh, together once more. Allow me to pray in order to bring our worship to a close. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of worship together for the company and the fellowship of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, for the guidance and the, and the steerage and direction of your word and for the empowering and encouraging presence of your Holy Spirit. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with all of those whom you love, now and forever. Amen. Bye for now.